Hi everyone, welcome to uh, your Paul's 2330 uh, study guide. This is your final exam study guide, which will take you from uh, questions related from uh, uh, questions related to module eight through to the end of module 15. And those are the modules we have covered in the second half of this course. Uh, the purpose today for this walkthrough is just to give you a kind of number of insights into the nature of the exam. You've already taken an exam like this before with me. Uh, you've taken the midterm. There won't be any surprises here um, in the sense that uh, the exam format will be very similar. Um, uh, there are some notes here at the start of the study guide which just uh, advise you, as I've done a number of times in the class, that while there aren't gotcha questions here in the sense that I'm not asking you about dates or data. Um, what I am very curious to have you do is to think, right? So there's um, a way of looking at this exam that it's an exam based on logic. Uh, a lot of the questions here will be logical. Um, that said, you won't understand the terminology and you won't understand the stakes uh, of the questions or be able to gain insight into them unless you have done the revision necessary and that's why this study guide is for. Uh, this study guide is to help you understand the terminology, uh, rather the study guide is to lead you in the right direction uh, so that you can research the terminology yourself in the assigned readings which you've already been covering all semester and thereby be well prepared. Um, so we're going to go through some of the questions in the study guide together that uh, might arguably be the uh, ones that uh, could benefit from a little bit of clarification or uh, some pointers from me. Uh, so that's the purpose of this uh, session today. Um, a quick word, it is useful to think about using the uh, elimination method here. Um, I think a lot of students um, don't take this as seriously as they should, but basically the elimination method is uh, premised on the idea that you should eliminate the most incorrect answer and work to the most correct answer um, available from the choices in front of you. Now, as I say here, that might sound odd, um, but Sometimes there can be questions that seem kind of right. And um, we have a tendency, I think, when we're taking multiple choice exams to sort of almost play devil's advocate for um, a, a, a point of view that's half correct or for a statement that's half correct. What you're looking for is the most correct answer. Uh, try to ignore the little voice in your head that tells you to go for the half correct answer. Um, are the, the 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 answer that makes you kind of go like, hmm, well, from a certain point of view, I guess you could say, no, kill that voice in your head. You're looking for the right answer, okay? So by starting backwards, picking the most incorrect answer and working your way towards the most correct answer, you will be in a much better situation. So that's the elimination method in case you are not aware of it. The exam will be available from 9 a.m. on Monday, May 6, 2019, uh, to just before midnight um, on Thursday, May 9th, 2019. Um, so you have um, uh, basically four full days in which to take the exam. Um, the computer you take the exam upon should be in a relatively quiet area. Uh, you may well need a webcam um, and that is in order to be able to show, uh, as I understand it, to show uh, your student ID card. So um, make sure your computer is in a quiet area. Uh, there should be no um, notes or books um, surrounding you. Uh, the desk should be clear. Um, and your computer should have a functioning webcam and you will need your student ID card. Okay, so if you don't have one of those, time to get one before you take the exam, okay? And you're gonna have 90 minutes, as it says here, to take the test. 
Now, in terms of stuff to be covered, basically everything that we've read or looked at since the beginning of mod of uh, part two of the course uh, will be fair game. Uh, that includes all these uh, uh, chapters from the main textbook, all the supplemental readings from Globalization Reader, um, and a number of videos which have, of course, been uh, posted in the syllabus and also in your checklists. So I have highlighted in yellow in this copy of the study guide, as you can see, uh, there's a number of questions uh, that I have gone ahead and highlighted, which I'd like to talk with you about today, uh, just to sort of um, help you um, address some of the issues. Some of these questions might be pertaining to things that were um, addressed in the checklists, uh, the journal checklists, but perhaps didn't uh, make it into classroom discussion. That can happen sometimes due to time constraints. So we start off here uh, with a question from the uh, uh, pertaining to the work of the well-known scholar Susan Strange. This um, was, of course, a uh, one of the mini essays in your Globalization Reader. And she, of course, is well known. You may not have heard of her before, but she's very well known for making the argument that the nation state is being undermined by the emergence of complex globalization, the interdependency, if you will, of complex globalization, which means that, you know, if you look at the company like Apple, a uh, very powerful company, very wealthy company, there's others like it, Google. Microsoft, um, Samsung, these are the titans of uh, global industry. Do they belong to a particular country? Once upon a time, we would have thought of Apple as an American company. But in fact, if you look at the nature of Apple's global supply chain, it's hard to say that Apple belongs to the United States of America anymore or is an American company or flies an American flag. It's a global corporation. And um, as such, Apple doesn't really care uh, where it locates its production or, uh, you know, um, which governments like it or don't like it. Uh, it doesn't take a side. What it wants is to find the most advantageous um, position from which to make profits. And so for Susan Strange, this is key, right? That, 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 that we live in a very um, economic era where the economy is sort of the priority in terms of how we make our political decisions, because of course, what all of this has done, the rise of these super corporations, is it's put the nation states on the back foot. Um, now, instead of them telling the companies what terms are under what terms they can do business in this or that state, um, it's the other way around. The, the, the companies are so powerful and command such economic wealth. They are also potential providers of great numbers of jobs. So the nation states actually are willing to sort of make compromises, bend over backwards in order to accommodate and in order to accommodate uh, these large businesses. So um, Susan Strange in her piece offers a, com a couple of different factors, two specific factors, in fact, uh, which she thinks are um, neglected um, factors um, in terms of understanding the pressure that the state has come under uh, due to the power of globalization. That is to say the power of these global corporations, but not just the corporations, there are other technological pressures and changes as well. So what you wanna be looking for in that essay are uh, the neglected factors. What are the main neglected factors that she describes? and be ready to pick out in the question, in the exam, um, an odd man out, okay? So you're gonna be looking for an odd man out uh, that, that, that would not match her core description of what globalization is 
and and what and you know the factors again that are driving globalization which she believes that scholars have neglected that scholars have not paid enough attention to moving along um we have an, a question here from the work of mike davies and um he uh, writes a very interesting essay about um, the arising global cities such as the city of Dubai, which really didn't exist only a decade or two ago. Um, it's kind of just popped up out of the desert. And um, Mike Davies is kind of interested in how these fantastical cities like Dubai come into life and the story that he tells is quite interesting again this is from your globalization reader um he makes an argument that uh there's kind of been if you want to use a word an economy of post 9 11 fears when you see the word economy sometimes it's just uses synonymous with circulation so it means there's a kind of a um, a supply and demand of fear in the in the world. You know that we're um, trading on each other's fears might be another way to put it. Um, so uh, how has this uh, generation of fear by Western media, for example, helped spring or spark or trigger the emergence, the springing out of the desert of this city, this miraculous, fantastical, futuristic city called Dubai? Moving along, um, we have a question here now, question six, uh, talking about the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, I put this in here um, because I think we spent some time, a lot of time really, um, um, hammering home this point in the class. And uh, I don't know that it, it, it uh, was, uh, something that uh, you as students necessarily grasped. So I'm, I'm just going to go over it one more time, uh, that and a couple of other uh, questions which are related to it, so that we're sure we're on the same page. Um, first of all, uh, what was the Treaty of Westphalia? Of course, it was the treaty um, that uh, uh, said goodbye uh, had us say goodbye to the era that we referred to as the era of Christendom, um, where the Vatican, uh, in a sense, constituted a supranational government, our generator of norms, uh, that uh, the states of Europe had to obey. Um, and this is very important because we tend to think of there being no real world government uh, today, um, at least the modern principle, the modern way of thinking about international politics is that there is no government over and above the nation states. And so, for example, it's for that reason uh, that we call international relations, modern international relations, that is um, a, a, a billiard ball model of uh, the relationships between states. And that billiard ball model is very important, right? Because it's this idea of snooker balls or pool balls on a flat table, and the states are just kind of bouncing around off each other, uh, opposite but equal reactions. It's very much grounded this idea of Newton Newtonian physics. Um, now, if you uh, imagine, however, that there was a time before modern international relations, um, a time that is before the Treaty of Westphalia, which separated church and state when it comes to foreign policy, um, you actually have the Vatican as being kind of a uh, supranational or world government of a sort um, that could ha exert a certain amount of power, a certain amount of normative power or coercive, excuse me, not coercive at all, um, but um, intellectual power, persuasive power, over the states to make sure that they interacted a certain way. So I hope that's clear um, because it is important. Um, we've argued in this class, if we want to understand 1989 as perhaps the second major turning point uh, in terms of the possibility of the existence of hierarchy uh, on the world stage. So 
prior to 1648, we have Christendom, which is not a billiard ball model. Then we have modernity, which lasts from 1648 to arguably 1989. And then you enter into the era of the network uh, driven by capitalism. The Soviet Union is now gone and globalization takes over. Um, that uh, may be uh, something that's very important to uh, consider. So this cluster of questions here, the cluster of questions to do with territory and 1648, um, all hinge around this understanding that we have three potential different eras to grapple with, to reckon with here. Now, question six um, addresses the question of the principle of Chius Regio, Eius Religio. And of course, we've defined that before as being uh, a Latin phrase. I'll just go ahead and give it to you. Um, uh, I, I, I don't have the textbook right in front of me um, right now. Um, I'm not going to tell you the sort of theoretical insight behind it, but the translation is to whomsoever um, the crown, so goes the religion. And your job in this uh, question is to identify uh, a statement which matches um, the model of power uh, that emerges um, after 1648. Okay, um, the, 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 the principle that most adequately captures the notion of the billiard ball model. Um, prior to 1648, we of course had the long war that uh, was a war that broke out um, over the emergence of Protestantism and the fact that um, you could have a Protestant king of a Catholic majority country or vice versa. Um, other kings, other queens might want to intervene then in their country to uh, to protect a religious majority, a religious minority, what have you. Okay, so it basically meant we were facing a number of wars where states were regularly interfering in each other's politics, domestic politics, in order to try to um, um, pursue the the cause of their own particular religious uh, minority or majority. Um, that led to, a, wasn't just one war, but it was a number of wars clustered together, um, which sort of became identified as one war. And uh, it lasted for a number of decades. What we're trying to identify here is again, uh, the agreement struck at the Treaty of Westphalia uh, that um, put an end to that extended period of war. Forgive me if I'm speaking uh, in a roundabout way, but I'm trying not to give you the answer. <laughs> okay, so moving on, question seven. After Westphalia, technological advances make it possible for states to acquire new powers, which for the first time make it possible to govern an empire at a distance. In lecture, what terms did we use to describe these powers? Well, of course, these are uh, powers that are described in your textbook uh, for the territory module and uh, it would be um, perhaps inappropriate for me to give you the um, the exact 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 answer but um, I, I, I don't think you'll have uh, too much trouble um, identifying it excuse me <coughs> question eight um, European imperialism spread the European model dividing the world into discrete states. The principal effect of this development in terms of the political development of the colonized territories was what exactly? Um, well, if you think about it, as we argued in class, those colonized territories, we, we use the example of uh, sub-Saharan Africa um, or the, 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 the African West Coast. Um, um, <clears throat> to um, 
we use that example in order to try to model this, th those countries didn't really exist in any uh, tangible sense before the arrival of the European powers. So those states themselves were sort of conjured up um, out of more or less thin air uh, by the European powers. And um, so consequently, uh, once the revolutions had taken place to eject, to get rid of the European powers, the establishment of those bureaucratic states couldn't simply be erased. Um, uh, the Europeans had completely uh, legally, institutionally uh, reoriented these territories and uh, there was no real going back uh, that those countries had already been integrated into the global economy. They, they had, um, you know, things like post offices and uh, telegraph systems, communication systems, militaries, police forces, garbage collection, you name it, right? And all of that, of course, required taxes and administration. And so in that sense, then, um, modernity was forced uh, onto these parts of the world. Um, I'll leave it at that, but I think you get the picture. So um, another lingering legacy of the emergence of territory and the spreading of this territorial model around the world um, is captured by the legal doctrine and the concepts attached to it of uti posseditis. And um, that is uh, uh, very much a question connected with what happened to these states once they got their emancipation. So please keep that in mind. Uh, you'll be looking for a statement um, that kind of captures the strange paradox, uh, that's the best way I can put it, of countries in, again, say Africa, struggling mightily for their independence from the European colonists only to find that they are kind of unable to put the genie back in the bottle again. Um, you can get your independence, but you won't look the way you looked before you were colonized in the first place. <clears throat> now, uh, the political economic perspective uh, on the emergence of the modern territorial state argues that the modern relationship of governance on, uh, with over territory, excuse me, only develops uh, with capitalism. And the question is, why is this? Um, well, it's a lot to do with the fact that, um, again, this is a, a major Marxist uh, point, but uh, you do not have private property. You cannot have private property unless you have a government, unless you have a state um, to enforce private property. Um, so it's an ironic thing, I suppose you'd say, really, that many um, people who are in favor of free markets and uh, are ardent, uh, as you might say, supporters of capitalism um, often talk about the need to get rid of the state or to shrink the state, to, to reduce the state to a bare minimum. But of course, that in order to have a state that is robust and capacious enough to guarantee uh, the existence of private property, to enforce and police um, the uh, reproduction of the regime of private property, uh, you know, you, you need um, a fairly complex state in order to be able to do that. Uh, you know, a state that's capable of surveillance, a capable of, a state that's capable of running sophisticated jails, etc., etc. A state that is capable of being economically robust enough to support all of that. So uh, your Marxist perspective there is going to sort of argue that uh, you uh, uh, need uh, a complex state, uh, that the territorial state is going to have to emerge because of the need for complex administration to make sure that property laws are respected. You know, boundaries need to be monitored. Courts, judges need to be appointed that understand these standardized systems of measuring the relationship between um, the law and, and the boundaries of the land. So hopefully that 
uh, will all help you uh, answer question 11. Now, um, question 12 here, um, Arjun Apadurai uh, is someone we encountered in our reader. And he uh, is someone very, very interested in the kind of complexity of global flows. One of the great examples that um, uh, he uh, uses is, of course, the example of karaoke. Uh, he looks at karaoke in the Philippines. And uh, his point is to kind of maybe get us as people who are interested in the sort of historical preservation of global cultures, I suppose you'd say, um, to maybe stop, uh, put, our, put our minds on pause for a minute or two and, and think carefully about what it means to suspect that Western culture is um, erasing all the other cultures of the world. Now, he's not saying that Western culture isn't powerful, but what he is saying is that it's uh, not a one-way street. It's not simply that Western culture arrives and gets to impose its preferred in, in, uh, interpretations and meanings of its cultural products on uh, the people that it's being broadcast towards. If you look at the Filipino example, for example, <laughs> example, for example, um, you find that uh, the um, karaoke, the case of karaoke, um, shows uh, there's a certain kind of um, transformation that's going on uh, there that, 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 that would indicate to the observer that it's not as simple as westernization or Americanization of Filipino culture. Karaoke isn't just, um, you know, pop songs from America being you know, uh, received and automatically reproduced. There's something else going on there. Excuse me. Um, now, moving on to question 15, um, we have a question here, uh, two questions here, in fact, um, by Michael Shapiro. Um, and this goes to the heart of um, something we labored on at length in uh, our class, which is that in an era uh, understood to be uh, constituted by the death of God, it is um, difficult for states, but also for other power regimes, power formations to, uh, to appear natural, to appear um, as, you know, and, and um, to appear to be part of our story. Um, I didn't say that very well. Um, to back up for a second, it was easier in the era of Christendom for states to claim that they uh, existed because God wanted them to exist it and that and thusly that the states had a good moral purpose and an, and a reason for existing um when god is dead as 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 in the modern era uh when we've separated church and state and and, and religion is no longer part of our um how should we say um a, a value system for the way we govern um, it's hard for the states to give us, that, for the nation states, that is, to give us a story. And so Shapiro explores this in his chapter in very, very interesting ways. And he explores uh, how the story that the nation state tells us about why it exists um, leaves certain things in and leaves certain other things out. And he uh, refers to Toni Morrison's novel Paradise as a way of trying to explain the um, way that certain things get forgotten and remembered by picking um, a very strange example of, of that same principle in action, but in a way or in a place where we wouldn't necessarily expect to see it. And so she, uh, it's Toni Morrison's novel uh, tells us the story of... Um, tells us the story of, of how this um, um, narrative of creating an identity in and around power uh, actually operates by looking at 
the plight, the story of um, a group of former slaves who uh, went to Oklahoma and um, found themselves shunned and uh, became a community unto themselves um, that was going to be different, you know, morally pure. Uh, but in in that effort to to be pure, uh, ended up visiting uh, the worst of its of the, the the worst sins that had been visited upon it upon others. Right. So that's the irony. Right. That's an ironic fate. Uh, you might say. So just be on your toes for that. You're looking for um, uh, a, a certain type of exceptionalism uh, that uh, Tony Morrison's trying to explain here. And uh, that won't, I think, be a difficult question for you. Um, the question 16 certainly will be a little more difficult, uh, and you will have to read that part of the chapter in order to understand uh, um, the, 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 the fate, you, you want to make sure you understand the, the fate and the controversy surrounding that fate and, and the lesson that Tony Morrison wanted us to learn from it in order to be able to answer that one. But there will be a number of uh, relatively sort of comparable statements <coughs> and uh, you'll have to pick the one that uh, most sort of uh, confirms the fate that, that those uh, slaves met. So moving on now to question 20. Neoliberalism began to become a dominant mindset among policymakers in the 1970s, but it contrasts starkly with the Keynesian policies championed by the U.S. government in the 30-plus years uh, following World War II. Uh, so what major economic crisis did John Maynard Keynes hope that his particular policies would prevent a recurrence of? Folks, I, I, this might actually be a very easy question um, if you've been paying attention in class. Um, but the idea here, of course, is just to highlight, um, again, what Keynesian economics uh, were and are. Um, you have uh, a collapse of the American economy in the 1920s and 1930s in the context of the Great Depression. And we have argued um, that the problem of the Great Depression <laughs> was a collapse of demand because people were holding on to their cash rather than spending their cash because they'd seen all their life savings eviscerated uh, because deregulated banks had decided to play uh, sort of, um, excuse me, maybe a better word to use would be gamble. Uh, the banks had decided to gamble with people's savings on Wall Street. Um, now, perhaps a uh, argument could be made that something similar happened in 2008, um, a slightly different version of events, of course, uh, because in 2008, it wasn't people's savings that got gambled on Wall Street, but paradoxically, their debts. And uh, that doesn't make any sense at all, uh, uh, unless you understand that um, debt is something that we can invest in. Uh, because if uh, you've taken out a mortgage, uh, the bank uh, who uh, owns the mortgage, uh, owns the title, can, um, on the bet or hypothesis that a certain income stream is going to come um, from you over a 20-year period paying off the debt, the bank can offer um, to others the chance to advance uh, to invest in that income stream. But of course, um, things went pear-shaped from there because uh, the economy collapsed, the housing bubble collapsed, and a lot of people could not then therefore pay off their uh, mortgage. And that led to the 2008 financial crisis. If you want a very good movie on this is uh, The Big Short. Why mention all of that? Well, because all of these questions from question 20 uh, on for the next little while are going to be related to this sort of long story, right, about the rise and fall of Keynesian economics um, uh, during the World War II period, and then um, the decline, uh, the, the, the disappearance of Keynesian economics in the 1970s. Um, so the Great Depression on one end, and then what you might call uh, the oil shock, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the Vietnam War 
three things together, putting an end to the Keynesian era in the 1970s. Just something to think about and, and something I wanted to mention as we got started here. Now, moving on to question 23, very important question. Um, from the 1970s onwards, we see the emergence of not Keynesianism, not Keynesianism anymore, but rather something called neoliberalism. So what's the deal with neoliberalism? Neoliberalism is a free market philosophy of government and uh, believes that government should be small and, um, and, and that it should not get in the way of business um, to any significant degree. Um, now, the thing Spike Peterson argues on page 275 um, is that uh, going to be, excuse me, just one second here. So the, the question on, on page 275, or the point that Spike Peterson is making on page 275 is that this narrative, this story of the free market orientation uh, uh, that the neoliberals espouse is is kind of two-faced, right? It's, it's just, um, I think from her point of view, not very honest. The actual historical record is that uh, the neoliberal system could never have come into existence uh, without the political power of states. Um, indeed, um, you can really sort of see this um, sort of uh, condescension of free market logic um, when you start to think about it on a global basis. Because it's all very well, isn't it? for wealthy Western nations to uh, lecture developing countries, for example, um, on the virtue of free market economics, when in fact, the wealthy Western nations did not themselves become rich through free market economics. To the contrary, they became rich through a close uh, relationship between business and the state um, especially uh, obvious in the era of imperialism. So uh, we can see numerous examples of the British state being used to uh, sort of act as a mafia enforcing agent on behalf of British corporations during the colonization of India, for example, according to Spike Peterson. Um, uh, the European states uh, guaranteed loans and used other techniques to incentivize um, the uh, extraction of mass amounts of raw materials from colonies um, over many, many centuries, uh, starting uh, with the Spanish and the Portuguese in South America. And then, um, of course, you could also make the argument that um, w in order to uh, legitimize and somehow naturalize this forced extraction of resources uh, from these colonized countries. Um, European governments uh, used arguments about progress and rational superiority in order to position themselves at the top of the state government systems of the people that they colonized. So keep those factors in mind uh, when you encounter this question. Uh, Spike Peterson is emphatic that the uh, idea that uh, the free market is a free market, uh, you know, w with a small state is actually quite historically ignorant. Um, the, the, the countries with the best free markets are countries that have deep and capacious state capacities and those state capacities are not cheap or free. Um, they uh, came from the accumulated wealth of centuries and centuries of taxation uh, based on prosperity uh, that would have been impossible without the expansion of the European empires. Um, so there's a reason why European and American 
why the European countries and the United States uh, have these uh, very, very different uh, historical statuses um, as developed powers and wealthy nations. Uh, and there's a reason, uh, and that reason is very much connected with the legacy of imperialism. Now, moving on to question 29 next, um, just uh, two more, or maybe one more up after this question to, to go. Um, uh, Danny Roderick, uh, you read a piece by Danny Roderick in your Globalization Reader. Um, he uh, believes that globalization has gone too far, and the question is what he means. By this, he means that globalization has undermined the authority of the states too much. Uh, the states are sort of forced now into a kind of uh, uh, a, 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 a catch-22, where if they try to help their citizens, of course, that costs money, which means that they have to raise taxes. And if they raise taxes, of course, it means that the global corporations we were talking about earlier on, Apple, etc., will be only too happy to pick, pack their bags and leave and move to another country that's willing to offer them a better deal. So nation states are competing with each other now to draw in through the use of low taxation rates, etc., to draw in these global corporations, which, of course, can potentially employ a lot of people. Um, but these are, of course, hidden costs of globalization um, that are not necessarily obvious to us when we're, um, uh, you know, just simply working for one of these companies. Uh, we don't get to see, we don't get to understand uh, the fierce and ferocious competition that's taking place between states and also the stakes of that competition in terms of the citizens of those countries who depend on the taxation that those countries can raise uh, in order to pay for uh, schools, hospitals, roads, telecommunications, etc. Right? Um, again, as we've said before, uh, no state on earth really is a free market system. Um, all states uh, need deep capacities, deep, deep uh, 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 institutions in order to be able to monitor and to police and to organize, administer, regulate, scrutinize etc. Um, their territories. Otherwise, uh, th those territories would be anarchic and, and the free market would not exist anyway because there'd be no underlying institutions to make it exist. Um, so it's very important that we understand that this idea of the state versus the market is quite spurious. Um, so what R Roderick is arguing is that states need to get together to strike a, a balance between openness to markets and, and domestic needs. Um, and um, there's uh, a number of reasons uh, what, uh, that, that he elaborates which, which would um, satisfy for him this balance, and he spells them out in the chapter. You, you want to just make sure you look um, in the chapter for what those principles are. Now, moving on to question 31, or excuse me, question 30, excuse me, um, David Harvey. Um, this is a great question, a question I'm very fond of. Um, David Harvey's an interesting guy. David Harvey says neoliberalism is an ideology designed to preserve the financial interests of the world's wealthy elite at the expense of those um, of the poor and the middle classes. Uh, that's very interesting, right? That that neoliberalism isn't just a, a theory um, that uh, is intended to uh, persuade us all to um, uh, join the free market system. That it's actually a ideology that uh, has a very explicit hidden function, and that is to make sure that the rich stay rich and that the poor don't uh, really, in any tangible sense, improve their welfare. So um, central to this ideology is an understanding of how property rights, free trade, and free markets should all be globalized. However, neoliberalism is not the only way of arranging capitalist markets. There are other countries, as he discusses, that have um, organized their production in other ways. And uh, with this in mind, then, we need to ask ourselves the question, what are the four elements of David Harvey's hypothesis? 
explaining how neoliberal ideology came to be such a powerful driving force uh, of globalization today. Um, now, without giving away the answer to this question, what you're looking for here um, is the part of that chapter uh, where he uh, shows um, the transformation or discusses the transformation uh, of class power, class power uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, without that transformation of class power, that is to say the diminishment of the power of the working class and the increase of the power of the financial elites, uh, you cannot have this expansion of uh, neoliberalism as a dominant ideology. So one of the keys to that, of course, is financialization itself. Another might be the rising power of the American financial institutions and the way those financial institutions used carrots and sticks uh, to persuade poor and developing nations in the world, especially to accept um, to accept the um, edict um, of the free market ideology that that the American backed financial institutions in the world were were espousing. So there were conditions, carrots and sticks, in other words. Now we're skipping over a few here. A lot of these questions here between 31 and 38 or so are gonna be um, to do with Paul Kamek's chapter. Uh, there's some interesting data in there and such, but I'm gonna skip over them folks because a lot of them are based on just going to the textbook and, uh, and, and, and grabbing the answers there. Um, 39, however, I think maybe 39, I can help you with a little bit. And um, 39, Milanovic discusses how globalization has evoked for us an imaginary community of world citizens to whom we can compare our incomes and welfare, right? Uh, so we have this global imaginary sort of average citizen in mind. And if our income and our welfare is not as high as theirs, then we kind of like, hmm, well, maybe we can improve ourselves, you know? Um, or if we're at the top, we can say, haha, you know, we're at the top here, we're, we're, we're winning. However, says Milanovic, it is difficult to figure out what method we can use to best assess actual difference in global incomes, right? Um, so it's actually very hard to measure where we stand relative to each other. Now, he says, in the mother of all inequality disputes, some uh, poorer countries, some poorer countries um, that appear to be doing well by one measurement are actually doing poorly by another. Yet, says Milanovic, even by the truest measurement, we may be seeing a very slight decrease in global poverty. And to what major change do we attribute this decline? Uh, what you're looking for here, folks, is the part of the chapter where he discusses um, uh, the, the, the fact that two uh, very large developing countries, shall we say, um, um, have have kind of had big by even though people in those countries remain poor it's because those countries are so populated um and they that because those countries have increased their welfare somewhat slightly um that you've seen a kind of a transformation in the global figures and so you just want to sort of pay attention to that um so let's see what we've got here just to wrap us up uh, guys uh, three more here i think and then we're done um as we discussed in lecture and discussed in Matt Davies' chapter, many people say millennials, that's, shall we say, you guys, more or less, Generation Y, have become post-political or, or have sold out. And to the extent that's true, what mitigating factors might we identify to explain this development? Well, one of the things we've talked about in class, excuse me, one of the things we talked about in class was how uh, people in your generation are fearful, for example, of college debt um, because incomes are so low compared to previous generations. Um, college debt, college has become more expensive. And so if incomes are lower, even if you can get a job, um, it's gonna take you a lot longer to pay off your college expenses than in previous generations, which in the 50s and 60s, remember, 
uh, were able to go to college more or less for free. So um, this is a new kind of historical phenomena, the phenomena of the middle class college student with the massive amount of college debt earning the very low salary. And um, many people speculate that it's not so much that millennials don't care about politics, it's that, that they've economically been pressured into not caring about pol politics or philosophy or anthropology, therefore not studying those subjects in college because they can't afford to really. It's, to, it's, it's not that they don't want to, it's just that it's kind of risky from an economic point of view. So we live in an age where um, where students are not taking... Um, the time to study the edifying, interesting, humanistic topics in college. Now, uh, when discussing the causes in question 44 here, when discussing the cause of the 2008 financial crisis, we discover limitations if uh, we are thinking, typo there, sorry, if we are thinking about the crisis, something that happened solely in the financial sector or in the sphere of circulation. Sometimes we've described this in the past as the crisis on Wall Street. You know, we think it was a crisis that happened on Wall Street. So Matt Davies discusses precisely this point in relationship to the cartoon by Professor David Harvey, who we met earlier on. Uh, but the link for this, of course, is in the document up above, but also in your uh, syllabus at the back. Um, what key point does Davis draw uh, from the David Harvey uh, cartoon? Um, the David Harvey cartoon, let me just, uh, sorry, I've lost my place here, guys. The David Harvey cartoon has a kind of a goal here, uh, which is to get us to think about um, the crisis in relationship to the wider phenomena, which he calls the sphere of production. And of course, that mode of production, if you will, is a capitalist mode. And so the 2008 financial crisis wasn't simply a mistake or a miscalculation, an error caused by, um, you know, an overly ambitious theory or something like this. Actually, there's a connection between the deregulation that led to the possibility of the crisis in the first place and the needs and requirements of capitalism, which had entered into a crisis of profitability and inability, in other words, to make a profit, um, already in the 1970s. And we've spoken about this all before, guys, because we said that, of course, that was when Germany and Japan and other countries that had been kind of decimated by World War II finally started to catch up with the United States in terms of their ability to produce decent goods and services and compete, therefore, with the United States, which had, after World War II, between World War II and the 1970s, really had not had many competitors for its advanced goods and services. So it's that crisis, this is the move Harvey's making, is he's connecting this crisis um, that the United States has, uh, where, uh, you know, it no longer has surplus because it's no longer uh, generating very many profits uh, because the other countries have finally caught up with it, if that makes sense. Now, finally, the last question we kind of want to look at here then, folks, is the one uh, relating to metaphors in security. And we've talked a lot about metaphors, haven't we? Um, we've already, even just in this video, talked about metaphors, the metaphor of the billiard ball uh, being the dominant metaphor for modern international politics. But we've also said since 1989, the world is now seen in network terms, and that requires new metaphors for us. So um, we talked a little bit about cancer, uh, we talked a little bit about molecular biology, but remember that the cancer metaphor is not really the metaphor, right? That's that's kind of the 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 the, 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 um, the way it's expressed, but the underlying notion is one of a flow of information. So it's actually this idea of networked information or flows of information that really we're trying to get at here, um, i.e., that globalization isn't physical. Globalization is digital. Globalization is um, flows of transport, flows of information, just like in our bodies, we have flows of DNA. So it's that idea then of information in flow, 
information routing as if it was in a computer grid and that you kind of want to zoom in there and of course that's the mcdillon uh, uh chapter so okay guys that was it um it was great uh, working with you on this thanks for watching uh, i enjoyed it and uh, thank you for taking the time i hope it's beneficial for you thanks again for a great semester um I, I, it's a great uh, testament to you as students uh, that you uh, embraced it as you did, showed such maturity as we dealt with and analyzed a number of complex topics. Um, I uh, can only say thank you for the privilege of, of, of being your professor. I wish you the best of luck with this exam. Um, I hope uh, you will find it uh, productive to study for it and that uh, some of these discussions and lessons will remain with you um, as you continue in your educations. Uh, do come back and see me again uh, for other classes in the future if, if, if they suit you, or just even to say hi and let me know how you're doing. Um, I'd always be glad to, to have a cup of tea or something. Um, if there's anything I can do for you moving forward, let me know as well. Thank you so much, guys. And um, if you have any questions about this study guide, uh, you are, of course, welcome to email me. I'll be happy to answer the question if I can. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.